Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece. Episode 23, this is Sparta. As we saw last episode, the Spartans propagandized that their constitution had existed from very ancient times. Set down at once by a mysterious, semi-mythical man named Lycurgus. We also laid out reasons why this probably was not the case. There can be little doubt that the Spartan state developed up to the end of the 7th century BC, on the same general lines as the other Greek poles, though with some remarkable peculiarities. And like most other poles, it passed through similar cycles of monarchy and oligarchy, and that the final form of the constitution was the result of a struggle between the nobles and the people. The remarkable thing was that throughout these changes, hereditary kingship survived. The Spartan government, when it was fully developed, had four parts. The kings, the council, the assemblies, and the ephors. The first three were common institutions among all Greek polis, but the latter, the ephors, was peculiar only to Sparta and states derived from Sparta. For this, the Spartan government was admired by its contemporaries. Since its constitution had elements of monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy, political theorists, like Aristotle, called it a mixed constitution. As with later on in the Roman Republic, the various organs of government and shared offices were designed to serve as checks and balances to one another minimizing the danger that the government would take too rapid and radical action. Spartan conservatism made for a reluctance to abandon traditional institutions, like the monarchy. Thus, even after the rest of Greece had abolished their Homeric-style kings, Sparta had two hereditary basileis, each descending from a different royal family, the Agiidae and the Eurypontidae, called a diarchy. The kingship was hereditary, but it was not necessarily the firstborn, but instead the firstborn while the father was king. If a king's marriage did not produce a son, the king was urged to take a second wife to help ensure the continuity of the male line. The kings were the only Spartans who did not go through the agoge, perhaps to avoid a potential social crisis. If he or his sons failed to stay the course, more on the agoge later. Like the Dark Age Basileis, the Spartans had military, priestly, and judicial duties. They appointed proxenoi, or guest friends, on behalf of the king himself, to be diplomats in other states, and pythioi, or those who consult the pythia. As we will see, the Delphic Sanctuary exercised great authority in Spartan politics. Also, if an heiress was without a husband, it was up to the kings to assign her one. They also oversaw all adoptions of children and the construction of public roads. The kings functioned as the chief priests and conducted all the public sacrifices on behalf of Sparta. They prepared the necessary sacrifices before battle, and their interpretations of the sacrificial omens influenced their decisions in military matters. The royal compensation for fulfilling the office of priest included a supply of animals for a monthly sacrifice to Apollo and subsequently, the special favor of the god. The kings were given the skins of the animals that were sacrificed. In addition, they held seats of honors at the banquets, were served first, and received double portions of the meat that was distributed. They did not consume the extra meat themselves, though, but gave it away as a gift, a practice that reflects the common Greek aristocratic system of demonstrating and consolidating one's power by showing signs of generosity, which extends far back into the Dark Age period. They were also expected to serve as moral examples. The kings also received great honors when they died. A carriage carried the body of the deceased king throughout all of Laconia, and all perioikoi were to go outside, donned in their mourning garb, to pay respect as the carriage with the deceased king passed by their town. For those who failed to do this, a heavy fine was imposed. The funeral was attended by a fixed number of perioikoi as well, and public business was not resumed for until ten days after the king's burial. According to Herodotus, the Agiidae were traditionally the senior king, 
probably because he was the king around Sparta first, before the two tribes combined. However, the two kings were constitutionally equal in authority. As in the case of the Roman consuls, the fact that there are two greatly diminishes their individual power. One had a veto on the other. Thus, neither could ever achieve ultimate control of the state. It seems probable that it was partly because of this that allowed monarchy to persist at Sparta. Their constitutional power was further diminished by the fact that the kings also sat on and had no special privileges among the aristocratic council of the Garosia, which discussed and voted on matters of state. It consisted of 28 elders over the age of 60 that were elected by the Spartan people, plus the two kings for a total of 30. The Greek word for elders is gerontes, hence the name Garosia. As we will see, 60 was the age at which military service terminated. Although the king's constitutional powers at home were strictly limited, the outstanding prestige that was gained from leading the Spartan army would greatly enhance the political standing and influence of the kings among the hoplites. Their influence was especially prevalent in foreign policy, especially if there was the possibility of a military expedition, since one of the kings would act as the general of the army. Aristotle writes, When he goes on a foreign expedition, he is the leader in all matters that concern the war. Therefore, his kingship is a kind of generalship, which possesses full powers, and is for life. There is only one instance on the historical record in which the Spartans adopted a policy in foreign affairs that was opposed by a king, that of Archidamus before the Peloponnesian War. There will be more on that in a future episode. According to Herodotus, one king had the power to unilaterally declare war, but if he did so, he had to be the first in line to charge and the last to retreat, which must have acted as some sort of check on warmongering. Herodotus writes, The Spartans have given to the kings these rights to wage war against any land that they wished, and any Spartan who opposes this is liable to be put under a curse. Doubt has been cast on this statement, as evidence from the 5th and 4th centuries BC reveals that this power was vested in the Spartan assembly. However, it is possible that the kings did originally possess this right. Another constitutional change to the kingship occurred after Cleomenes and Demaratus engaged in a heated argument over strategy shortly before battle, leading to the abandonment of the Spartan invasion of Athens at the end of the 6th century BC, an event we'll cover in a future episode. But from then on, it was no longer allowed for two kings to campaign together. The Spartans then passed a law mandating that while one king served as general of the army, the other must remain in Sparta and supervise domestic matters at home. Also, in the field, the king had unlimited power of life and death, and could order an execution for a soldier who perhaps didn't display enough courage or disobeyed his commands. But with the later addition of the ephors, more on them shortly, they were made responsible to the community for their conduct in their campaigns. The members of the Garosia served until death, since they weren't eligible until the age of 60, which is when military service terminated. They most likely didn't serve for that long anyway. Election to the Garosia was the highest honor to which a Spartan could aspire. Candidates appeared in front of the assembly, in an order determined by lot. The winners were chosen by acclamation from those in the assembly, a procedure which Aristotle criticized as childish. He believed only the worthiest should be appointed to leadership positions, whether he chooses to run or not. Because only new members could be added once a member died, the system lent itself to cronyism and corruption. Regardless, although the Garantes were elected by the people, they were not elected from the people. Nobility of birth retained political significance at Sparta, and only men of the noblest families, presumably those who had achieved their status prior to the Lycurgan land reforms, that we will discuss shortly, could be chosen as a member. And thus, the Garosia formed an oligarchical element in the Spartan constitution. In any event, the Garosia exercised a probuletic function, meaning that after a preliminary discussion between its 30 members, it then prepared the agenda, consisting of proposals that were to be decided and voted upon by the assembly. In this way, no bill could be brought forth before the assembly 
unless it was first discussed by the Gerousia. This control of the issues to be discussed gave the Gerousia the greatest power and influence in policy making. This power was further increased by their ability to refuse to ratify the Assembly's decisions on the grounds that the Assembly had altered the original motion. Because, as Aristotle puts it, the Damos speaks crookedly. According to Aristotle's commentary in Plutarch, when the Assembly began to distort the original motions by adding and removing clauses, the kings Polydorus and Theopompus, who ruled jointly in the early 7th century BC, added this power. However, it seems unlikely that the Gerousia could have exercised this veto power in decisions about war and peace, as an assembly of current warriors wouldn't have accepted such a veto from former warriors. The Gerousia also was influential in the conduct of foreign affairs through its position as the highest law court in Sparta. It heard cases of homicide, treason, and other serious offenses that, if found guilty, carried the penalties of death, exile, and the loss of citizens' rights. Even the persecution of a king could come before the Gerousia, and eventually the five ephors. More on that shortly. There is far more evidence of political trials in Athens than in Sparta, but in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, at least seven kings and several other important military men had to face prosecutions that were in reality politically motivated. It would take a brave and confident king to pursue a policy that did not command the support of the majority of the Gerousia, knowing that in the event of failure, he was likely to be prosecuted upon his return. In terms of its membership, the Spartan Assembly was the most democratic organ of the Spartan government, for it consisted of the Damos, which is the Doric way of saying Demos, and contained all adult male citizens over the age of 30 which was the age they completed their military training. There will be more on that shortly. It originated from the idea of having all the soldiers to have the ability to participate in decision-making. Most decisions that needed to be made probably were whether to go to war, make peace, or to form an alliance, as well as elect members of the Gerousia, as we have previously discussed. They came to the meeting, called the Appella, in full military uniform, once a month, outside during a full moon. At the time of the festival in honor of Apollo, they responded to the questions brought forth by the Gerousia, by acclamation, meaning they banged on their shields, either for a yes or a no. If the loudest side could not be determined, then they were separated on each side to determine the count. Debates in the assembly were infrequent, though. According to Aristotle, the regular citizens were not allowed to speak, only those of the Gerousia, the kings, or the ephors. But there has been much scholarly debate on this. Because if Polydorus and Theopompus added the power of the veto by the Gerousia, because the assembly was, as Aristotle put it, distorting and twisting the proposals by adding and deleting words, then the average Spartan must have had the ability to debate in the assembly, and that amendments or even counterproposals from the floor were drastically changing the original decisions of the Gerousia. So either Aristotle got it completely wrong, or the Spartan citizens originally had the ability to address the assembly, and then lost it later. I tend to agree with the second option, as it would jive with the Spartan way of life. They were trained to obey their superiors, and to conform, not to take sides in public debate. In fact, Lycurgus was said to have outlawed rhetoric teachers. This ethos gave rise to the English word laconic, derived from laconia which is used to describe a sparse style of speech, or someone who talks very little. A later addition to the Spartan constitution was the five ephoroi, or ephors. According to tradition, they were first instituted in the early 8th century BC, but its political importance would begin to increase in the mid-7th century BC forward, supposedly at the behest of Chilon, who was one of the seven sages we discussed last episode. It's likely that as Sparta became more militaristic, the kings found it impossible to attend all of their duties, and were forced to give up their civil jurisdiction to the ephors, who became a sort of a judicial overseers. In fact, ephor literally comes from the Greek words epi, which means over, and horeo, to see. This is clearly a sign of some tremendous political and social upheaval. 
the E4s were, in a sense, similar to the Tribune of Rome, a permanent revolutionary office that becomes a central part of the state. It is unparalleled elsewhere in the Greek world. The E4s also had to be over the age of 30 and were elected annually in some sort of odd randomness, one each from the five territorial tribes, or Obe, that identified with one of the five component villages of Sparta. They were referred to as Hoitakontes, or the lucky ones. An ephorship lasted only for one year, and they could not be chosen again, ever. One of the ephors was eponymous, meaning his name was used at Sparta to signify the year. For example, such and such happened when so and so was ephor. The beginning of a Laconian year fell on the first new moon after the fall equinox. According to Plutarch, when the ephors first entered office, they issued a decree that all citizens should shave their top lips, meaning their mustaches, and obey the laws. By the 5th century BC, they were constitutionally the most powerful public officials at Sparta. According to Thucydides, they were in charge of the day-to-day business and were also the main executive body of state, implementing the decisions of the assembly, at which they presided. Aristotle relates that they were also in charge of private lawsuits and in all cases involving the perioikoi. Xenophon tells us that they supervised the other public officials, having the power to suspend, imprison, and even bring capital charges against them, though these type of cases would also have to be heard with the garrisia present as well. The kings took a mutual oath monthly in which the kings swore to rule in accordance with the law, and if they did, the ephors would uphold their rule. In doing so, the ephors also had the power to summon a king to answer questions, and he could only decline twice, so that on the third time, he would be forced to show up and answer. If the ephors believed a king had committed a wrongdoing, they would go to Delphi. If the oracle supported their claim, then the king was put on trial by the Garrosia. If convicted, he was usually exiled. The powers of the ephors eventually expanded until they also dealt with issues of foreign policy. They would receive foreign ambassadors to ascertain their business. If something involved war, peace, or alliances, they only had to get it approved in the assembly. However, it would have been reckless not to go through the Garrosia first. In time of war, it was their responsibility to organize the call-up of the army and to decide on the precise size of the army that was needed for the upcoming campaign. When the king set out on an expedition with the army, he was always accompanied by two of the ephors. Aristotle saw the ephors as the most powerful of the four key political institutions at Sparta and recognized that it was this post rather than the power of the assembly, that kept the Spartan people content with their constitutional position in the state. Although it might seem like the ephors and kings would be involved in a constant struggle for power, that was not the case. The ephors were elected annually, and there is every reason to believe that there were not only differences of opinions over policy between successive boards of ephors, but also between individual members of the same board. As we will see, There was often serious disagreement, even personal animosity, between the two Spartan kings, and it is likely that each king would have had his supporters among the five ephors. It is also vital to keep in mind that the ephors, for all of their constitutional power, only held office for one year, and since they were of non-noble stock, once their term ended, they returned to political obscurity, whereas the prestige of the king was long-standing. Therefore, it is dangerous to deduce from the ephor's constitutional power that they had undue influence, because any ephor who was too zealous in the exercise of his constitutional power at the king's expense was well aware that he was vulnerable to retaliation at the hands of the same king as soon as his term was concluded. Since antiquity, many political theorists have admired Sparta's government believing it to confirm the basic principle that the best guarantee of stability lies in a blend of monarchic, oligarchic, and democratic elements. Certainly Sparta had kings, and as we will see, the strong ideology of economic equality amongst male citizens fostered an egalitarian spirit. In reality, however, the oligarchic element considerably outweighed the other two, 
power laid predominantly within the Garosia. As time went by, moreover, the five E4s also gained increasing power over the kings and frequently took the lead in framing Spartan foreign policy. Even if we discount the 95% or so of disenfranchised residents of Laconia, those being the Perioikoi, the Helots, and Spartan women, the truth is that even within the small subgroup of male citizens, participation in government was limited to a very smaller group of men, most of which, if not all, were extremely rich. The Second Mycenaean War had been a terrifying revelation of the potential risks of the Helot system, and the possibility of another revolt haunted the imaginations of the Spartans and emboldened their enemies. The solution they chose to avoid such a catastrophe was drastic, and its implementation gradually transformed Sparta into the unique regimented society known to us from the classical sources. Simply state it, the Spartans realized that if all potential hoplites could be mobilized and trained to the highest degree of skill possible, Sparta would enjoy an overwhelming military advantage over its helots and other enemies. Therefore, the Spartans reformed their institutions with a view towards achieving two goals. The male citizens of the five villages that originally constituted Sparta were free from everything but military obligations, and socializing them to accept the extraordinary regimentation and discipline required of a Spartan soldier. Until the Hellenistic period, the Spartans would be the only real professional soldiers. In effect, they waged a perpetual war against the Helots, and were consequently always prepared to engage in other acts of aggression when necessary. As a result, Sparta developed into a slave-holding state like no other Greek polis. However, there is much scholarly debate about the nature of these changes especially on the issues of land tenure and inheritance. The land in the Eurotus and Pamissus valleys had become public land in the form of Claroi, assigned to around 9,000 Spartans in equal plots of land. Each Claros was assigned a requisite number of helots, though they belonged to the polis as a whole, not an individual master. Thus a Spartan had no power to grant freedom to the helot who worked his lot, nor could he sell him to another Spartan. Only the state had the power to reassign or to emancipate. The Helots farmed their assigned land and provided a portion of the agricultural produce for that Spartan's family, that being 70 medimni of grain for the man, 12 for his wife, and a stated portion of wine, oil, and fruit. The Helot was allowed to retain all that the land produced beyond this. Essentially, the Helots were tied to the land and duty bound to pay rent through agriculture. They were allowed to marry because, well, the Spartans wanted them to have children, and thus future generations of little helots to till their land. They also seemed to have been allowed to practice religious rites. While they weren't chattel slaves, as in other parts of Greece, being a helot wasn't exactly an easy life either. The Spartan poet Tertaeus gloatingly described the helots as burdened like asses, bringing to their masters under harsh compulsion one half of the fruits of the land. In this manner, later ancient commentators described the Helots as between slave and free. The Perioikoi, however, retained their personal freedom. The exact nature of their role in Spartan society is not clear, but they seem to have served partly as a kind of military reserve and partly as agents of trade and industry. They never revolted, so they must have been assimilated into Spartan culture very early on. Although they were not able to achieve citizenship, and thus a say in the governmental apparatus. Their hoplites served increasingly with the Spartan army, and although they may have fulfilled functions, such as the manufacture and repair of armor and weapons, they were increasingly integrated into the combat units of the Spartan army, as the Spartan population began to decline. Since Spartan citizens were debarred by law from trade or manufacture, the Perioikoi had a monopoly on trade and manufacturing in one of the richest territories of Greece which explains in large part the loyalty of the Perioikoi to the Spartan state. Laconia was rich in natural resources, fertile and blessed with a number of good natural harbors. The Perioikoi could exploit these resources for their own enrichment, and they did. The Spartiatai, who were the citizen soldiers, only had two functions, to fight 
and to prepare to fight. The Spartiatai also were a small minority of the people in Laconia. It is believed there were seven helots for every Spartan, and the amount of perioikoi is unknown. By the Persian Wars, according to Herodotus, there were only 8,000 Spartii left. Thus it very much was an oligarchy, with a few ruling the many. Although they were vastly outnumbered, the Spartans combated this by developing a state-sponsored system of humiliation and violence towards the helots, to keep them in a constant state of fear and repression. The helots were forced to wear animal skin clothing and hats made of leather or dog skin, and annual beatings were implemented in addition to religious holidays, where murdering helots was allowed without reprisal. Helot men were also forced to serve in the army, but as slingers or some other low position, or to accompany Spartan hoplites on the march and carry their heavy gear and armor, while women were used as wet nurses or some other role in the domestic staff. Xenophon wrote that the Helots felt such hatred for the Spartans that they would be glad to eat them raw. Regardless, such brutal oppression of the Helots permitted the Spartans to control the agrarian population and devote themselves entirely towards military practice. Contrasting the freedom of Spartan citizens from ordinary work with that of the Helots, the later Athenian Critias remarked, Laconia is the home of the freest of the Greeks, and of the most enslaved. Much of the scholarly debate is centered on what happened to the land after the first generation after the Lycurgan land reform. The popular belief is that although initially public land when redistributed, the land became privately owned once again, and the usual rules of inheritance for Greek polis applied, whereby a father bequeathed his land to his children. It is also argued that land was inherited not only by the sons, but also by the daughters, who may have received as much as half of what her brother or brothers would have received, and was given out as a dowry when the daughter married. It is this different system of private ownership and inheritance that explains more convincingly the continual decline of Spartan citizens from the 5th century BC onward. Aristotle reinforces this belief in his politics when he says, For the lawgiver, intending that the Spartiates should be as numerous as possible, encourages the citizens to beget many children. But it is obvious that, if many are born, and the land distributed accordingly, many must inevitably become poor. However, some Spartiates carefully planned their marriages and procreation to consolidate their land holdings. Families were thus kept small to prevent the diminution of the estate, owing to too many heirs. As we will see later, wives were shared between two men to keep the number of inheriting children small in both families, because the marriage of half-brothers and half-sisters with the shared mother, but different father, would result in the inheritance and concentration of even more land. A childless Spartiate also could adopt a kinsman as his heir, instead of having children himself, thus keeping the land within the kinship group. Not all Spartiates took this approach, though. Some families who followed the lawgiver's encouragement for larger families inevitably fell into poverty, as their land was divided up at their death among their sons and daughters into increasingly smaller parcels of land. Over time, the increasing accumulation of land by a smaller number of Spartiates resulted in the reduction of many citizens to non-Spartiate status. Aristotle also writes, To sell land is considered shameful by the Lacidaemonians, but from the ancient portion, it is not allowed. It seems that there was two categories of land in Sparta, private land that could be sold, although socially unacceptable, and state-controlled land, that being the ancient portion, which was expressly forbidden to sell, it's not sure what is considered the ancient portion, though. It most certainly refers to the Claroi of Lycurgus. But was that divided up before their conquest of Messenia, or after? If it was divided up before, who received the lands of Messenia, and the lands of later conquests? And was this then able to be sold or transferred? If so, what were the stipulations in doing this? These are all questions that we cannot give a definitive answer to. There has not been one consensus among scholars on this issue. In any event, thanks to the law against trade, commerce, and luxuriousness, Spartan homes were very plain and rough. Furniture had to be built and finished using nothing more than an axe and a saw. One way in which the Spartans made wealth less desirable 
Lay in the fact that Sparta refused to adopt the system of making silver into coins in the manner of other Greek cities. Although it was minted locally, the use of gold and silver as currency in commerce was permitted by the Perioikoi, who conducted business with the rest of the Greek world. But the Spartans themselves were only permitted to use iron ingots for money, as Sparta had one of the best iron mines in Greece. Iron spits, as you recall, had been used throughout Greece before the invention of coinage. While iron is great for weapons, bulky and heavy iron ingots made it unwieldy for currency. Xenophon remarked that a thousand drachmas worth would fill a wagon in Sparta. The point here is that nobody would do business with anyone whose money is worthless, and thus they couldn't purchase any foreign goods. This all ensured that nobody was jealous of another's wealth. As Plutarch records, Merchants sent no shiploads into Laconian ports, no fortune teller, no harlot monger, or gold or silver smith, or jeweler, set foot in a country which had no money, so that luxury deprived little by little that which fed and fomented it, wasted it to nothing, and died away of itself. Nevertheless, there seems to have been some wealthy families, who were rich enough at least, to breed racehorses and win victories on several occasions at the Olympic Games. So some sort of wealth somehow was introduced into Sparta, possibly from the acquisition of later lands that we spoke about last episode. Furthermore, Spartans were also forbidden from traveling abroad, except on state instructions, and foreigners were not admitted to Sparta without supplying a very good reason for doing so. This was to prevent the citizens from being corrupted by foreign ideas and morality. In doing all of this, the entire Spartan system tried its best to create a utopian society by eradicating inequalities among its citizens and conditioned them to think and act the same. As the poetry of Tertius made clear, the Spartan ideal for a man was to be skilled and courageous in battle, neither to run away nor to surrender, but to stand his ground and give up his life for Sparta. Training was designed to produce men who conformed to this pattern alone, and the process for creating invincible warriors began at birth. Whereas other Greek poles left the choice to the father, officials from the Gerosia examined a newborn baby boy to determine if it had good health. If it was crippled or deformed in any way, or perceived as puny, the child would be thrown into a chasm on Mount Tigetus, known as Apothetai, or literally to throw away because the Spartans wanted healthy children, who would grow up to become strong warriors. Female babies, though, were not subjected to official scrutiny, as they did not fight in the Spartan army. In any event, those males who were accepted were carefully brought up, as Plutarch describes. The women did not bathe the babies with water, but with wine, making it a sort of test of their strength. For they say that the epileptic and sickly ones lose control and go into convulsions, but the healthy ones are rather toughened like steel and strengthened in their physique. The nurses displayed care and skill. They did not use swaddling bands, making the babies free in their limbs and bodies. They also made them sensible and not fussy about their food, not afraid of the dark or frightened of being left alone, not inclined to unpleasant awkwardness or whining. Thus. Even some foreigners acquired Spartan nurses for their children. Also, the father did not have the option to decide how to raise his son. Rather, all boys received the same training and education under state supervision, a system known as agoge. A Spartan boy entered into it at the age of seven. He was taken away to a military school, supervised by the ephors and a sort of state director of education called the padanomos. The older boys were allowed to bully the younger ones to toughen them up. They were trained in groups, called herds, so that the child would become used to being in a unit and learn conformity, obedience, group solidarity, and military skills. They only learned reading and writing for basic needs, but nothing superfluous, like the fancy liberal arts. And instead, their early education focused on enduring pain and hardships, such as going barefoot to toughen up their feet not being allowed to sleep for long periods of time, and being withheld from food and water, all situations that could occur as soldiers. At the age of 12, their heads were shaven and they lived in the barracks. They did not supply the boys with shoes, 
wore a tunic, and were given only a single red cloak to wear, in all kinds of weather. Since it got really cold at Sparta in the winter, they wanted them to learn to bear the cold. Unlike the rest of the Greeks, who made war only in the summer, the Spartans were perpetually at war with the Helots, and therefore needed to be prepared to fight year-round. The E-4s inspected the boys daily and examined them in the nude every ten days. They slept in groups on a self-constructed mat of pulled reeds, and they took daily baths in the icy waters of the Eurotus. The food given to them was a simple black gruel, whose main ingredient was said to have been pig's blood, and they were only fed enough to keep them alive, but no more so that they would be lean and tough, and able to withstand the hardships of campaign. Thus the boys constantly were hunting for food to supplement this diet. It was understood that they would try to steal from helots, but if they got caught, they were whipped. Not as a punishment for stealing, but for being careless and getting caught. Plutarch relays a story of a Spartan boy, who after he had caught a fox, they were ordered to get into formation. The boy did not want to lose his meal, so he tucked it under his cloak and stood in line, dutifully not wanting to be disciplined. Meanwhile, the fox, wanting to get out, began to gnaw at the boy's side, and the boy allowed it to do so, because he didn't want the theft to be revealed. Eventually the fox gnawed deep enough that the boy dropped dead without saying a word. This story is probably false, but the imagery is evident. The Spartan system created tough, disciplined boys who had reverence for the Spartan state. A similar toughening up process also occurred during the annual games at the altar of Artemis Arthea, a Spartan cult dedicated to the hunting goddess. It seems that the Spartans had a rather unique devotion to Artemis, and many votive ivory plaques have been found at this shrine. In any event, at the annual games, young contestants had to brave their way through a force of older youths, yielding whips and guarding the ultimate prize of cheese. The boys were expected to take whippings without uttering a sound, as their blood splattered on the altar. Needless to say, it was not uncommon for some to die during the festival. It is a sad irony of history that what began as a solemn test of manliness, witnessed only by the goddess and the community, would attract tourists in the Roman times. The show was so popular that in the 3rd century AD, a stone theater was built in the sacred precinct. Sightseers could view the spectacle of Spartan youths, exhibiting their legendary endurance of pain without flinching or crying out, as they were brutally flogged, sometimes to death in front of the altar, egged on by the priestess of Artemis, holding a statue of the goddess. In any event, competition was also encouraged in the form of athletic contests and other public displays of prowess, but a spirit of cooperation was considered essential as well, and it was instilled by forming groups of boys and creating rivalries between them. In this manner, the herds of boys were matched against each other in violent games with a ball and in straightforward fights. The boys also were taught musica, meaning poetry. The words taught moral lessons for them to live by, and they would march to the music of these poems during battle. Learning to speak laconically with brevity and wit also was taught. From the age of 18 to 20, the young men were marshaled in a huge school, formed on the model of an army, where they were rigorously trained in hoplite warfare. Those who instructed and controlled them were young men who had passed their 20th year, but had not yet reached the age of 30, which was the age that admitted them to the rights of a citizen. Warm friendships often sprang up between the young men and the boys whom they were training. In fact, it was typical for a young boy to have a formal arrangement with an older, unmarried man, who was expected to act as a kind of substitute father and role model for him. It's also relatively certain that these two had sexual relations. Xenophon says that this relationship was strictly a mentorship, and not physical, but that is hard to believe. It very much was a homoerotic relationship. In fact, the elder man was called Erotis, or the lover, and the young boy was called Eromenos, or the beloved. We must keep in mind that the ancient Greeks lacked the binary division modern society tends to impose between people who are considered homosexual and those who are viewed as heterosexual. 
Also, the disapproval that attaches today to romantic connections between teachers and students, or between old and young, would have puzzled the ancient Greeks, who viewed the erotic element in the teacher-pupil relationship as a constructive building block in the education and upbringing of the young. Furthermore, they wanted quality men who were attached to one another to give the phalanx a boost. Exactly how much physical sexual activity was involved, though, is unclear, since many Greek intellectuals, who had left written records of social customs, like Xenophon, tended to be embarrassed about sex, and were eager to stress the cerebral element in same-sex romantic connections. Regardless, it was just a passing phase, though, and it was considered inappropriate to continue this relationship after the boy's beard began to grow. Once the boy became of age, he himself then became the Erotus and took upon an arrow menace under his wing. Nevertheless, some relationships did develop between companions of the same age and endured throughout their lifetime. We know less about the homoerotic bonds between women, but Plutarch reports that sexual relationships of this type were so highly valued that respectable women would in fact have love affairs with unmarried girls. Furthermore, the erotic element in the songs of the female choruses of Alkman can be seen. For males and females alike, liaisons with members of the same sex provided much of the companionship, sexual pleasure, and sense of spiritual well-being that many people in modern Western society nowadays often associate with marriage. Homosexuality, as we call it, was in many ways integrated into their way of life. Young Spartan men completed their training at the age of 20, and thus were permitted to start growing their hair long, unlike men in other parts of the Greek world, as well as the traditional long beard, but no mustache. Those with such success, that they were marked out as potential future leaders, would be given the opportunity to test their skills and prove themselves worthy of the Spartan military through participation in the Cryptea, or secret police. Every autumn, the ephors declared war on the helots so that any Spartan citizen could kill a helot without incurring the religious pollution that usually accompanied acts of homicide. Plutarch gives a vivid picture of what occurred during the Cryptea. He writes, The Cryptes were sent out into the countryside in different directions for an entire year to spy on the helots, equipped with only a knife and battle rations, and forced to survive on their own skills and cunning, and to take whatever food they needed. By day, they would disperse spots in order to hide and rest. At night, they made their way to roads and murdered any helots that they encountered. Frequently, too, they made their way through the fields, killing the helots who stood out for their physique and strength and who might be prone to rebel. Only those Spartans who had served in the Cryptea as young men could expect to achieve the highest ranks in Spartan society and army, because it was felt that only those Spartans who showed the ability and willingness to kill for the state at a young age were worthy to join the leadership in later years. This feature of government was unique to Sparta among the Greek cities, though the Persians also had an elaborate spy system. In any event, one of the foremost honors attainable to the Spartiates was to qualify for enrollment as a member of the Hippogrites, which means commander of the horse, an elite class of 300 warriors who acted as the king's personal bodyguard. I'm sure you are all very familiar with this group of 300 men, even if you didn't know their name. In any event, the only way to be removed from this group was to commit an act of propriety, so there were constant fights and false allegations by those trying to get someone thrown out so that they could get in. One had to have completed the Cryptea to even be considered for acceptance. Also at the age of 20, Spartan men were allowed to marry, but they still were not allowed to live at home. Thus, they stayed at the barracks and had to sneak away to be with their wives. If they were caught, they were punished. The paradox is that the Spartan system tried to suppress them from having children and a family because the polis is more important, but they needed children to maintain the polis. Plutarch mentions that Spartan men were reluctant to marry and that the state had to provide incentives for marriage and the production of children. Since Spartan women married at about the age of 18, 
and men between the ages of 20 to 30 usually. Spartan spouses were closer in age than their counterparts at Athens, where it was common for a 14-year-old girl to marry a 30-year-old man. The marriage ceremony in Sparta, as described by Plutarch, was very odd and clandestine. The man would seize his bride-to-be, and the so-called bridesmaid then took charge of the captured girl. She first shaved her hair to her scalp, then dressed her in a man's cloak and sandals, and finally laid her down alone on a mattress in the dark. The bridegroom would slip in at night, undo her belt, lift her, and carry her to the bed. After spending only a short time with her, he would depart discreetly so as to sleep back at the barracks. Very long periods could go by before a man could secretly sneak away to see his bride. So much so, as Plutarch describes it, that some might even have children before they saw their own wives in the daylight. He continues, Such little intercourse was not only an exercise in self-control and moderation, but also meant that partners were fertile physically, always fresh for love, and ready for intercourse rather than being sated and pale from unrestricted sexual activity. Moreover, some lingering glow of desire and affection was always left in both. In addition, the random selection of spouses is a symptom of equality, for one spouse is as good as the next. Since the sole purpose of marriage was reproduction, the secret of trial marriage permits the couple to find other spouses if their union proves to be infertile. If these customs were ever practiced, they had apparently died out by the classical period. The absence of adultery at Sparta, however, continued to evoke comment among non-Spartans. Xenophon also mentions a combination of practices that satisfied both the private desires of individual women and men, as well as the state's goal of producing young Spartan warrior citizens. It seems that if a man was unable to procreate children with his wife, he was supposed to choose another man to impregnate her. On the other hand, if a man did not want to cohabit with his wife, he had the ability to seek permission from another man to impregnate the other man's wife. While this is peculiar, and I'd like to think that most men wouldn't be down to let someone else impregnate their own wife, Xenophon says that in this way, a man could add more children in his household, but did not have to legally give them any part of his inheritance money, as it would be the real father who's on the hook. The extent of which this was practiced is unknown, though. In any event, Finally, at the age of 30, they were allowed to live at home with their wives, but they still had to eat dinner at the common dining club, like an army mess, called a sasitian, literally meaning having food together. All citizens were required to do this, even the kings and the elders. There were about 15 men selected to each, and it helped to strengthen the platoon. However, there was no limit to how many members could be in each sasitian. They were selected at the age of 20, and that would remain their sasitian for the rest of their life. Each applicant was scrutinized by the current members of the sasitian he wished to join, any of whom could blackball the prospective member and force him to look for another group. When it was time to vote on his acceptance, each member of the mess dropped a pellet of bread into an urn, and if a single man squeezed his pellet flat, the candidate was rejected. To fail to become selected to any mess at all meant being a social outcast. There'll be more on that shortly. Members of the mess ate all of their meals communally, and each member had to provide a set quota of barley, wine, cheese, and figs from their claroy, as well as money for meat and fish to the common mess. They also had to provide meat from personal sacrifices and the animals that they had hunted. Personal sacrifices and hunting were the only excuses that permitted the Spartans from not eating with their comrades. Speaking of hunting, the Spartans especially loved to hunt wild boars. The Spartan ideal of austerity dictated that the cuisine be nutritious and served in portions that were adequate, but hardly generous. In some cases, small portions may have been a blessing. The staple of the common mess appears to have been a dish known as black broth for its dark gray color, composed of pork cooked in blood and seasoned with vinegar and salt. It was apparently an acquired taste, and the few foreigners who made their way to Sparta were repelled by it. It is reported that one ancient visitor to a Spartan mess hall from the colony of Sybaris in southern Italy remarked, Now I know why the Spartans do not fear death. The Sicitia, 
the plural, were in some ways analogous to the symposia, or drinking parties, enjoyed by Greeks elsewhere. But the fact that the Spartans were purposely schooled to drink in moderation points to an important difference. Though the Greeks usually mixed their wine with water, helots were brought in and forced to consume undiluted wine and to perform vulgar and ridiculous songs and dances. Young Spartans, who were invited to the Sicitia as part of their education, were encouraged to laugh at the spectacle of the drunken helots. The lesson was twofold. From this experience, youths learned both to be weary of drinking in excess, for inebriation could lead to death in conditions of perpetual warfare, and to view the helots as pathetic creatures, patently inferior to the Spartans. In this way, the older Spartans headed off any qualms that the younger Spartans may develop about treating the helots as subhuman. The experience of spending so much time in the Sicitia schooled Sparta's young men in the values of their society. There, they learned to call all older men as father to emphasize that their primary loyalty was to the group and not their genetic families. Even at the age of 30, a Spartan man was now no less at the beck and call of the state than he had been as a boy. Plutarch writes, Their training continued right into manhood, for nobody was free to live as he wished. But the city was like a military camp, and they had a set way of life and routine in the public service. They were fully convinced that they were the property, not of themselves, but of the state. If they had no other duty assigned to them, they used it to watch the boys either teaching them something useful, or learning themselves from their seniors. This entire Spartan system, meant to instill discipline first and foremost, as well as self-reliance, since they had to fetch their own food, social cohesion and loyalty to one another, and the polis at large, obedience to the superiors, physical and moral endurance, courage and uniformity. All went through the same system and same experiences, but still were in competition for honor. The men referred to one another as homoioi, meaning similars. However, age was given tremendous respect, too. Over time, inequalities happened by means of wealth. If someone were to lose their kleros for whatever reason, he would lose a status as a homoioi, because he no longer could provide food to a sisitian. Also, you could lose your citizenship by not making it through the agoge, or by being declared a coward in battle. If a Spartan hoplite ever returned without a shield, it was assumed that he had thrown it at his enemy in an attempt to flee, an act of cowardliness. A coward in the rest of Greece lived much differently than one in Sparta, since martial valor offered the sole path to honor and respect of one's peers, those who were unable to cope with the rigors of military life and those who lost their status, lived a wretched, intolerable life afterwards. Their ridiculous appearance publicly announced their disgrace, as they were forced to shave off half of their beards, and wear cloaks with colored patches that identified them as non-spartiate. They were called hypomaeon, or inferior, and those who fled in battle were also stigmatized as tremblers. All non-spartiates could not hold public office nor was it likely that a woman would be given in marriage to someone who lost their citizenship, or that anyone would marry their sisters. Also, only the child of two legitimate Spartiates could become a citizen. In addition to the illegitimate Parthenai, who left Sparta in the late 8th century BC to found Teros, there arose a class of persons who sprang from illegitimate unions of Spartiate males and Helot females, known as Methones. Just as the Spartan men were very different compared to the rest of Greece, the Spartan women were very much different than all other Greek women. Although they weren't examined at birth, they underwent a fairly extensive formal education cycle, at the state's expense, where they were taught how to read and write, making it the only contemporary Greek polis to educate its female population. Unlike other Greek females, who spent most of their time indoors and were regularly given less food than the men, Spartan females exercised outside and were well nourished. Plutarch writes, Lycurgus made the girls exercise their bodies in running, wrestling, and throwing the discus and javelin, so that their children, 
taking root in the first place in strong bodies, would grow the better. And they themselves would be strong for childbirth, and deal well and easily with the pains of labor. While the men exercised in the nude, the other Greek women were not allowed to engage in this type of behavior, because it was shameful for them to be seen in the nude. However, the Spartan women were allowed to engage in dancing and athletics, and they did so in the nude, and even in the presence of the boys, a liberty which shocked many other Greeks. Furthermore, unlike other Greek women, who wore heavy, concealing clothes and were rarely seen in public, Spartan women wore short tunics and went wherever they pleased. Hairstyles distinguished maidens from those who were married, for the latter wore their hair short, unlike the adult women in other parts of the Greek world. Spartan women also enjoyed unparalleled status, power, and respect. With their husbands so rarely at home, they directed the households, which included the servants, their daughters, and sons, until they left the agoge. They controlled their own property, as well as that of male relatives who were away with the army. In fact, Aristotle reported that women were sole owners of two-fifths of all land and property in Sparta. As we saw earlier, women inherited a portion of their father's kleros. Also, while male infanticide was practiced, it was not for females. And it's quite likely that some families only ever had daughters and not any sons that survived examinations. Thus, there probably was a substantial imbalance in the sex ratio. So with a declining male citizen population, Aristotle's statement does have some credence behind it. In any event, laws regarding divorce were the same for both men and women, and Spartan women rarely married before they were 18. Since helots took care of farming, they were not expected to perform any domestic or money-making activities. Though, like all Greek women, they did know how to weave, but their sole responsibility was to produce warriors for the polis. A physically strong woman would produce physically strong offspring. For Sparta, childbirth was comparable to a man's military obligation. In fact, there are only two ways one could have gotten their name on a gravestone in Sparta. By dying on the battlefield, or by dying while giving childbirth. Both were seen as the ultimate sacrifice. While the highest honor given to an Athenian woman was that she was never spoken of, this was not the case in Sparta. One of the most persistent myths about Sparta that has no basis in fact is the notion that Spartan mothers were without feelings towards their offspring and helped enforce a militaristic lifestyle on their sons and husbands. The myth can be traced back to Plutarch, who includes no less than 17 so-called sayings of Spartan women, all of which paraphrase or elaborate on the theme that Spartan mothers rejected their own offspring if they showed any kind of cowardice. In some of these sayings, Mothers revile their sons in insulting language merely for surviving a battle. These sayings purporting to be from Spartan women were far more likely to be of Athenian origin and designed to portray Spartan women as unnatural and so undeserving of pity. In any event, quite possibly the most well-known is this. When a Spartan man went off to war, a Spartan wife presents him with a shield and says, Come back with this or on it. Unfortunately, as powerful as this image may be, it is almost certainly propaganda. Spartans buried their battle dead on or near the battlefield, like the rest of the Greeks. Corpses were not brought back on their hoplons. Although, as we have discussed, the hoplon was the most important aspect of the phalanx, and thus we can see the symbolism in the quotation. Also, Plutarch reports that when a foreigner visited Sparta, he said, You Laconian women are the only ones who can rule men. To which she replied, That is because we are the only ones who give birth to men. With the benefit of hindsight, Aristotle complained that Spartan women enjoyed altogether too much freedom, power, and prestige. The constitution of Lycurgus, he believed, was flawed from the start because only men conformed to it, while women escaped its regulations. He was convinced that Spartan women indulged in every kind of luxury and intemperance promoting greed and the eventual degeneration of the Spartan ideal of equality among male citizens. He also maintained that the Spartans' freedom to bequeath their land as they wished, and the size of dowries led to two-fifths of the land, in his own time, having fallen into the hands of women. The truth of this statistic is impossible to determine, yet it does seem to be the case that Spartan daughters received as dowries one-half the amount of their parents' property 
that their brothers would have received as inheritance. In contrast, at Athens, daughters received approximately one-sixth the amount that their brothers would inherit. Yet Aristotle no doubt exaggerates when he complains that Sparta was ruled by women, for they had no share in the government. Clearly, however, their ownership and control of property gave Spartan women far more authority than their counterparts in the rest of the Greek world. Since Aristotle's convictions about the need for men to control women clearly played a role in shaping his perceptions of the Spartan society, it is hard to know just what to make of his complaints. We will talk more about women in the ancient world when we get to Athens, but it is difficult to evaluate the status of women in antiquity, especially in the case of Sparta. Opinions vary according to whether one believes that it is possible for a Spartan woman to enjoy a good life within a totalitarian, militaristic state or not. The entire Spartan system was a remarkably successful experiment in what is now called social engineering. Despite the ideology of equality among its citizens, disparities of wealth did not disappear. Many Spartans had only their kleros to support them, whereas wealthier Spartans owned additional lands. But except for the members of the royal families and the tiny group elected to the Gerousia, the role played by differential wealth in determining status and power was far smaller in Sparta than in other Greek polis. The Spartans called themselves homoioi for good reason. Rich or poor, they all had survived the same judgment at birth, endured the same training, wore the same uniform, and fought side by side with the same weapons in the phalanx. It is easy to gain an impression of the Spartans as a totally boorish and joyless people, but there is no evidence that the Spartans as a whole ever became restless over their way of life. Though as we have seen, there were some who failed to live up to the ideal standards expected of them. For many, the communal spirit and dedication to the state must have been very satisfying. Inevitably, there was most likely a great deal of banter in the messes. But of course, the Spartans were famous for their use of dry wit that says much in a few words. The Greeks even had an adjective for it, laconikos, or laconic in English. For example, when a Spartan was asked why it was that Lycurgus had made so few laws, he replied, Men of few words require few laws. Another, in reply to someone who was praising the people of Elis for their fairness in the management of the Olympic Games, answered, Yes, they deserve a lot of praise if they can do justice one day in four years. The retort of a Spartan to an Athenian who said that the Spartans had no learning was, You are right, we alone of all the Greeks have learned none of your bad qualities. It can be seen from such remarks that the Spartans were both intensely patriotic and sure of their superiority over the others. With their conquest of Laconia and Mycenae, the Spartans created a situation where they never constituted more than a small faction, perhaps one twentieth, of the total population of their territory. Hence, as is often the case with ruling aristocracies, their numbers were never deemed to be sufficient. Furthermore, unlike other Greek states, at the very start, the lack of trade and colonization limited the growth of Sparta's population, for it had only two colonies to which it might sometime in the future export a population that could no longer be supported at home. In addition to male infanticide, their limited opportunities for intercourse with their wives during her peak childbearing years, and the Spartan soldiers' obligation to die on the battlefield rather than surrender or flee, xenophobia also restricted Sparta's numbers. Unlike the Athenians, for example, at no time did the Spartans marry foreigners, nor did they recruit large numbers of new citizens of non-Spartan origin, though the desperation occurred during the Peloponnesian War did move them to take some exceptional measures. In this emergency, they allowed some non-Spartiates to be trained to serve in the army. Thus, there eventually became two exceptions to the rule that only the son of two Spartiates were able to attend the agoge and thus become citizens. The Trophimoi, or foster sons, were foreign students invited to study. The Athenian general and historian Xenophon, for example, sent his two sons to Sparta as Trophimoi. The other exception was that the son of a helot could be enrolled as a syntrophis if a Spartiate formally adopted him and paid his way through the agoge. If he did exceptionally well in training, he might be sponsored to become a Spartiate. But those were much later exceptions and ultimately didn't fix their issues as the population problem would be even more acute in the Hellenistic period. 
The Spartans were perhaps the best fighters the ancient world had seen. But what ultimately separated them from the Romans, who developed the best army, was this particularism that we've discussed. The Romans were inclusive, not exclusive, and in doing so they guaranteed that they had inexhaustible manpower. The Romans could lose disastrous battles, but they would regroup, draft more legions, and strike back. If disaster beset the Spartans, as we will see, it was catastrophic. Nevertheless, there were many people from other parts of Greece who greatly admired Sparta. Among these was the philosopher Plato, and when in the course of his philosophical inquiries, he constructed an imaginary ideal state, it had many points of similarity to Sparta. Most of the admirers were people whose political views were in favor of the aristocracy, living very often in city-states, which had been impacted by a series of political upheavals. They looked enviously at Sparta, with its order and discipline. Sparta had avoided the tyranny of many other states, by compromising at an early stage, and adopting a constitution which had some features of monarchy, oligarchy, and democracy. These writers were predominantly from Athens, a city-state who within a few centuries saw their political pendulum swing from monarchy, to oligarchy, to tyranny, and finally to the world's first democracy. And so it's to Athens where we turn next. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 24, Early Athens. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes on your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, Magic of the Ancients, from his album, Apollo's Liar. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientliar.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify. Thank you.